the late 1980s into the 1990s saw a raft of small independent Italian teams make their way onto the grid and pretty much all of them had a pretty spectacular failure rate. So much so that there was an entire website dedicated to these failures. A website that sadly no longer exists. In the era of pre-qualifying, these teams were the main attraction. The likes of Eurobrun, Onyx, and even First Racing, who never made the grid because their car failed the safety tests and later, somehow, got onto the grid in 1990 as the Life F1 team. They often didn't make it beyond this Friday afternoon session because they could be anywhere as much as 6 to 10 seconds off the pace of the cars at the top end of the grid, which would kick them well out of the 107% times today. But one of those teams that tried to get themselves up there was a small team from Italy called the Coloni team, headed up by Enzo Coloni, and they were in the sport between sort of 1987 and 1990. And at one point, they got themselves an engine deal with Subaru. Now, I don't know how many pictures you're actually going to see in this video because of the old Creative Commons stuff, but I will try my best. The Coloni had joined the F1 paddock back in 1987, joining at that season's Italian Grand Prix. But it wasn't exactly the best of starts given that Monza favoured turbo engines and Coloni had just popped whatever they could get their hands on in the back of the car, and it was hilariously outgunned, being two seconds slower than the car in front. That car in front being a Nasala that in itself was 10 seconds off the pole time. For the Spanish Grand Prix, however, they would actually make the grid. Just. By only a tenth of a second. But Nicola Larini's qualifying heroics were for nothing because his suspension failed after only 8 laps or so. So that's a good thing, right? They can make a grid. They proved it. So for 1988 they brought pretty much the exact same car. The driver was different though. Larini had gone to Acela so they brought in Gabriele Tarquini to drive the car and managed to achieve the unthinkable at Canada with an 8th place finish. Now given the fact F1 cars were hilariously unreliable then compared to today, Tarquini finished last on track. Two laps down. And got no points for the trouble because it was only the top 6 in those days and not the top 10 as it is today. Don't know if you can hear that but I live in the flight path of Birmingham Airport. But Coloni had managed to nab some talented people from fellow Minnow's AGS. There was the designer Christian van der Plien, R&D guy Michael Costa, and team manager Frederick Deinhout. This, along with the banning of turbo engines for 1989, gave the team some new hope for being competitive throughout 1989, and maybe more top 10s would be on the cards. They even expanded to be a two-team operation. Tarquini left to join the first racing team, which ended up being a stillborn operation, and later managed to get a drive with Osella. So in response, Coloni managed to sign Pierre-Henri Raffinel, who brought in some much needed cash given that he was sponsored by a French TV channel. And in the other seat replacing Tarquini was a young Brazilian driver who had just won Formula 3000. Roberto Moreno. Cue the force memes. Thanks to Tarquini's heroics the previous season, Moreno didn't need to go through the embarrassment of pre-qualifying like other people, but Raffinal, who was considered to be a new entry in the eyes of the FIA, had to go through the rigmarole of that Friday afternoon session before he could go into the qualifying session proper, and he had to do this against an unprecedented 12 other cars, because 1989 had the biggest entry list in Formula 1 history. Miraculously, both Coloni cars were able to qualify for Monaco, and it was the only time in the team's history that they managed to do it. Moreno was in 25th for that race, while Raffinal was 18th ahead of the likes of Nelson Piquet and René Arnoux. But then, both cars retired with gearbox issues. And that seemed to be the case whenever the car made the grid, as the same thing happened at Montreal. And then Raffinal decided he was going to move to another team and take his French TV money with him. But hopes for the car getting good increased when the team managed to acquire a designer called Gary Anderson. Irishman Anderson was the man who designed the Jordan 191 and, well, a lot more Jordans as it so happens. Anderson was able to design the team a brand new front wing and Moreno, whose run of bad qualifying sessions meant he now had to go through pre-qualifying, managed to fly around the Estoril track. But then he hit Eddie Cheever and destroyed the nose, so he had to use the old one and wasn't as quick. By the time the season ended, the exodus of staff meant that the team was left with just the two drivers, six mechanics, and the team manager. So for 1990, it was going to be great news because Coloni was going to be the recipient of a works engine deal. The bad news, it was from Subaru. So why was Subaru, of all people, trying to enter Formula 1? 
It's because Honda was already there and they'd been cleaning up with Senna, Prost and McLaren. And McLaren had won the World Championship the two previous years, with one win for Senna and one win for Prost. Yamaha had been in Formula 1 for 1989, powering the Zack Speed team to... Well, nothing, really. Zack Speed only qualified for two races that year, Brazil and Japan with Bernd Schneider, while not even pre-qualifying for the rest. Yamaha wouldn't be present for 1990, but they would return for 1991 to power the Brabham team that was clinging on for dear life, and then they would later supply teams like Tyrrell and Arrows. During 1989, Subaru had outsourced the design for a flat 12 engine, a boxer engine to be precise, to an Italian company called Motori Moderni that was going to be given to Minardi. But Minardi decided to partner with Lamborghini in the end so they had an all Italian construction for their cars and instead Subaru partnered with Coloni, even going as far as to buy some shares in Coloni, 50% of the team, to you know keep Coloni alive longer than they otherwise would have been. And while flat 12s had been used in the past, most notably by Ferrari and Alfa Romeo, and Ferrari had won championships with them, by the start of the 1990s it was V-engines or nothing. A Honda V12 would win the championship in 1991, but Motori Moderni believed the centre of gravity provided by a flat 12 would be better for the car. It wasn't. The engine was overweight and underpowered. The target was 600 horsepower, but it didn't make anywhere near that much, and in terms of weight, it was over by 112 kilograms. And that engine was connected to one of Minardi's gearboxes, which in itself weighed 159 kilograms. And because all of that weight was towards the rear and further towards the rear than it should have been, the car wanted to spin every time it went into a corner. The car didn't complete a lap at Phoenix, and at Brazil it was 10 seconds off the pace. The car didn't get out of pre-qualifying once all season, and employees were threatening to quit over the performance of the car, and the fact that team owner Enzo Coloni was supposedly not paying anyone for their work. There was also miscommunication between Coloni and Subaru. Who was in charge? Nobody knew. So Subaru decided to buy the team outright, but there are rumours that while Coloni signed the documents, he never actually handed over the team, so he was still trying to hang on to what was left. Subaru eventually had enough and pulled out entirely at the French Grand Prix, leaving Coloni with a supply of Ford engines to get through the rest of the season. Crikey, it's the Rosas. Bertrand Gachot couldn't pre-qualify until Belgium, but that was only because circumstance had gone in his favour. The withdrawal of the Onyx team promoted Ligier into the qualifying session proper, so now Coloni only had to beat three cars. The Eurobrun cars were just going slower and slower and slower, and the Life team was... Well, it was the Life team. So he managed to get into the sessions, but he was still way, way, way slower than everybody else ahead of him. Coloni and Life were the only two cars to not start a Grand Prix in 1990, and because there was so little staff at the team, design of the 1991 car was outsourced to some students at the local university. But Enzo Coloni was at the end of his tether with uncompetitive machinery. In 1991, Lamborghini and Jordan arrived on the grid, and Jordan managed to be able to do things as a brand new team that Coloni wished they could have done as a new team. He was paying a driver, well, he wasn't paying a driver because things happened and the car hadn't been tested all year. So with nothing left to do, he decided he was going to pull out, and he sold the team to another Italian, a shoe salesman called Andrea Sassetti. The Andrea Moda team that Coloni became was the worst run team in history. The Life team from 1990 was the slowest team in history. But in terms of a strike rate getting out of pre-qualifying sessions, the Coloni team has to be one of, if not the worst. Coloni's not making the grid strike rate between 1988, their first full season and the end of 1991, being a whopping 83% failure rate. Now Coloni would go back to F3000, which is now yeah, Formula 2, GP2, whatever you want to call it, in 1999, and did have a little bit of success. But it showed. Getting the people together for a team is one thing, but getting it to actually work is another. So then, a look at the failed Coloni team and their partnership with Subaru. If you've learned something new from this video, or if it's brought up some memories of those late 80s years, then do give the video and like. And for more stuff like this, get subscribed with that bell on, so you never miss out on anything I do here. Massive thanks to the kind folk over at Patreon, and if you want to help contribute to the Image Buying Fund, you can do so by clicking the link in the description, where there's also a link to Discord, and also to my socials. So until next time, I've been Aidan Mord, have a cracking day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.